coming up on this episode. You know, my whole life changed for me on, on April 10, 2003, where we were in a firefight uh, in Baghdad taking presidential palace from Saddam. And I got hit by an RPG. West 73, Eastern, there is a large urban sprawl. Low pass, show of force confirmed that at the enemy. Outside the wire. Welcome to episode two, um, Outside the Wire. Yeah, so let's uh, dig right in. Episode two, I kind of wanted to talk about what I like to call the critical mass. The point where you reached where your whole world kind of either exploded or imploded or you reached that moment where you're like, you know what? I'm an asshole (laughs) and I need to do something different because... The path that I am traveling on is a path of destruction and not in a good way. You know, there are times where the path of destruction is awesome. As an 0331, I like to line them up and take them down. But when you're outside the military and you're back home, it's not necessarily appropriate and it's not necessarily. Yeah, it's frowned upon (laughs) and it's also very self destructive. You know, for me, 2003, Operation Iraqi Freedom, when we first went in to uh, take Baghdad and take that country from uh, Saddam, um, was definitely something, you know, when I enlisted, I knew what I was going to do. I knew what I signed up for. I was going to be a Marine. I was going to climb the mountain, slay slay the dragons, and uh, transform in that awesome uniform and be an expert at everything. That wasn't the case. So, Um, funny thing real quick. (laughs) When you say slay the dragon, yeah, slay the dragon. You're talking about the the commercial, the commercial. Yeah, the commercial. So I was in boot camp <laughs> when that commercial came out, and I remember my younger brother. I think he was, I don't know, four or five at the time. Writes me this letter, and he's like, "Greg, are you are you gonna have to slay the fire breathing monster?" And I was like, "Rob, I already did that. <laughs> yeah, he's done. No dragons. I didn't find any dragons. I'll nah, tell you just that. a big but stupid hill. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know. But but for me, you know, at that point, I had been in a little bit, and I was a corporal when I went over in uh, Iraq, and I had a squad handed to me with with guys, and I had was in charge of. I was an O three thirty one, and I was in charge of making sure their safety and well being, and. I'm a young guy myself, and it's like, oh, cool, all right. Yeah. But that's where I, I kind of had that, that epiphany for me was like, this, this is for real now. You know, like this isn't, this isn't training. This isn't the crew. I mean, if you look back at all the training you had in the military, the easiest part was boot camp. You didn't have to worry about dying, really. You know, my whole life changed for me on, on April 10th, 2003, where we were in a firefight uh, in Baghdad taking presidential palace from Saddam. And... I got hit by an RPG, and uh, that was that was for me. That was my my turning point where I got hit, and it was the point that you're no longer you're no longer playing anymore. You're you're done. You get to sit this one out. Go to the you know go to the bench, and I didn't I didn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, and we'll we'll fast forward. You know, coming out, I dealt with a lot of surgeries. Um, I couldn't talk for months. I couldn't eat for months. Um, I had a trach. It was put in here and uh you know i took a lot of the, the stuff away from my nose and my taste buds for then and they put a smaller trach in to do other surgeries because they had to keep it because the head is i don't know if people know this but it's a pretty vital piece of organ that you yeah, carry yeah. and you get hit in it <laughs> your um, grapes pretty important yeah you're not uh you know that's why you know you, you drive more motorcycles you wear a helmet you know things like that you should probably wear a helmet when you're doing like extreme stuff um but so it's not like they could just slap a tourniquet on my head and call it good. <laughs> I mean, that wouldn't be good, right? So, um, you, you know your you know your relationship with your corpsman. If yeah. he starts putting a cor- or a yeah. tourniquet around yeah, your neck, you're pretty much screwed, or you really pissed him off. Um, so, I for me, I had a family. I had a newborn, and yeah, you you said your daughter was born yeah, while you were there. Yeah, when I entered the country, that's when I had, you know, my first sergeant and chaplain standing there going, congratulations, Dad. And I'm like, oh, awesome. All right. You know, I mean, yeah, I was, don't get me wrong, I'm very proud, but you're thinking about what you're about to go do and you're yeah. like, oi. And there was always that, that you know, that, um, you know, back in my, in my mind going, okay, 
you know, this is real. This isn't, this isn't crucible. Um, yeah. I mean, cause for me, I know when I deployed, I tried to wrap everything up. Like I can't imagine your experience versus my experience. I deployed in 04 and I think we're right around the same age. I didn't have a family or I had a girlfriend and mom and dad, obviously, but I broke up with my girlfriend. I tied up all my loose ends and basically had, I, I paid any bill I could pay off. I, I didn't want anything. I didn't want to have to worry about anything. So I went there with like very clear focused. I didn't think I had the maturity <laughs> at that age to be focused on the job I had to do and also be worried about a wife or kid. So like, I, I mean, for you and you know, so many other people that were deployed, that's that happened uh, a lot, right? You get a lot admiral, of admiral, admirable that you were able to do it, but you know, a, a lot of stress, I'm sure. Oh yeah. I mean, it, you had to have those real talks before you left. Like, okay, I'm going to come home. I'm not telling you I'm coming home, but yeah. you know, I, like I said, not really a thought in my mind. You know, we, we talked about it. We sat down. Hey, there's a good chance. I'm, you know, we're about to do something that, you know, is, is going to be dangerous. And, you know, there's a good possibility that I might not come home in one piece. Yeah. I told her, you know, I would do everything I could to come home. Oh, well, you know, after you kind of get that, now you're over there and you're preoccupied with that. And then you have a newborn that you don't get to meet. That, that's, uh, that, that was rough. That was hard. All right. So we'll fast forward to April 10th when we were in a pretty good firefight. And I would probably have to say this was one of the bigger ones we had been in at this point. I got hit and literally it was a flash. It was like that. I got my jaw wired shot. I got a trach. I can't, um, my retina got detached. Uh, I knocked out half the teeth. You have 32 teeth in your mouth. I had half of those knocked out. Um, and I have the doctors telling me, going, we have to replace this bone in your face and we don't know where we're going to get the bone from. You know, they talked about taking it from my lower leg. And then if that was the case, that weakens the structure there and you might not be able to just take a running leap off of things. Well, that's not what I envisioned my life for at 24 years old going, okay, cool. You know, and I knew I wasn't going to take it lying down. I yeah. needed to get up and start moving. And, uh, but I realized along the way, like, you know, you're talking about critical mass and when you became an asshole. <laughs> and, and for me, I was just a little asshole along the way. Oh yeah, over, I was definitely. Over span, I was always span an asshole, time, right? Over a span of time, it just got it got until to you, the point where it was like no one wanted to be around right, me anymore. Right. Until your point where your wife, yeah, you know, you might like my wife. She's sitting there like, you know, you're out of control. Like you're out of control. Like, yeah. you know, I can't take this anymore. Yeah. And then you go, oh man. And then it's like the aha moment. Take away your speech for a while, right? And you can't talk. And the only communication you have is writing, right? And you have your your high school sweetheart there, and you know, you want the TV, so you point to the TV, and they're like, what do you want? And you're like, and you point again, and you get mad, and then you're like, I don't understand what you want. What do you want? So now you knife hand the TV, like, towards the TV, right? <laughs> you know, and then you look back at that and go, wow, that was a real asshole move of me, because how is she, how is she supposed to know what I'm thinking or going through right. at the time, right? People who can't communicate their point are the ones that when you, you shout or you escalate what you're trying to say. And it's interesting. You're talking about like sometimes taking that, that two second pause to then communicate what you're trying to say in a, in a way that someone who's probably cares about you yep. is able to hear without coming across as like a knife hand in the face right? or, you know, a verbal onslaught of like you dumb MF or like, I'm trying to tell you something, you know what I mean? So I, I totally, but the frustration, it's, it's. Because you know why? You know why we are frustrated? Because it's, it's us going through that. I mean, you possibly couldn't understand what I'm going through and what I'm right. dealing with. It's, you know, you weren't, you weren't shot, you know, to her, you know what I mean? And it's like, and I thought about that and I'm like, eh. you know, after, you know, talking to people and, and, and people being in my life and putting that, turning that light bulb on and going, aha, oh. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, and like to your point, yes, they weren't shot, but also it's traumatic. You weren't the one who had to experience someone you cared about get shot. Uh, one of the things that you know, I'm going through counseling. You know, every couple of weeks I go, and and for me, it's it's like an ongoing process. Like I, it's like peeling the onion back. Yep. You keep working on a different layer, and it's a new problem every week. And 
I'm working on certain skills that I'm getting better at. And it, for me, it's, it's about mastery. It's, you know, same thing with a, a rifle or a, or a machine gun. You don't just pick it up the first day and you're great at it. You might have some natural talent and ability in certain areas and others that you might suck. But for me, you know, it's, it's about the next thing. And for me right now, the thing that I'm working on most is empathy. I suck at empathy. Um, and Fuck it up, buttercup. Yeah, like <laughs> just the the suck it up mentality. <laughs> Being aware of what other people are going through is such a hard thing to do when you're so focused on what you're battling or where you're struggling. And to be able to do that simultaneous to to deal with your own stuff and also be aware of, hey, you know, my wife's going through this. Could I maybe cut her some slack? You know what I mean? Like, no. it's not easy. So, so again, for me, you know, the critical mass, yeah, it, you know, I had a career, you know, like I said in previous podcasts, I decided to do a nice safe job like law enforcement. And uh, you really learn a lot of empathy for people because everybody thinks that just law enforcement officers out there, you know, just enforcing the law and that's, that's it. It's the way it goes. But, you know, just to put something in perspective, when I go out on a call and I say have an accident, right? Something as simple as an accident, like a fender bender. And you got people yelling and screaming and crazy chaos going on. And as the, you know, in, in my role, you take a step back and go, what's, what's the big deal about it? It's a fender bender. What's the big deal about it? Right. But to that person that's in it, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Right. They, they think their life's over, their car's wrecked, they can't get to work, whatever. Yeah. Right. So, you know, for, for me, I kind of started feeling like I was, I was involving myself a lot in work to where I was starting to sacrifice um, family time. And being there when I should have been at home, I was out at the bar hanging out with the boys. And, uh, you know, because those are the guys that would relate to you. You're, you know, your, your family can't relate to you. They don't possibly know what that right, was yeah. like. And then, uh, you know, so I went, I went to a course down in uh, Virginia. It was a, a buddy of mine. He's a retired Navy SEAL. His name's uh, Jason Redman. And uh, he, had a, a, he had a company at one point that it, uh, he's kind of, he had to close the doors on, which is, it's sad, you know, but he's doing bigger and better things now with his life. And uh, it, this, this was a two-week program that brought a, bu a bunch of wounded warriors down there. And it wasn't just guys that got shot. It wasn't guys that just got blown up. It was guys that had post-traumatic stress. It was guys that, you know, did their time in the service and saw their buddy get blown up or whatever. You know, that's, an, that's traumatic stuff to deal with, right? Yeah. So. What he, what, he, what he taught us is he taught us how to take our story and be able to tell it. And that's what's so awesome about this duo right here and us doing what we're doing. Because I think, I think this is what's going to help. Yeah. And, you know, it was getting yourself, uh, you know, mentally right. Getting yourself, you know, if you're, if you're a spiritual person, getting, getting your, your spiritual, you know, your Zen, whatever that is. Yeah. There's all kinds of worship, right? Um, getting yourself physically fit, you know, yep. taking pride in that. And if you kind of think about, Hey, there's a lot of things we learned in the service, right? That, you know, a soldier needs to be, you know, soldier, Marine, all, all the, all the walks of life are the same thing and we need to be prepared, ready to go. Right. And that's what that whole course was about. And I had an aha moment when I was down there going, wow, I was an ass. I, I'm, I'm an asshole. Yeah. And, and not that I'm at, like, out in life, you know, I mean, people that would know me, you know, wow, you've done great things, da da da. But to the people that counted to, yeah, you know, where you're blowing, we always them, heard the ones, you yeah, you're blowing them off, you're, right? And you kind of think about that, and it's just like, ugh, you know, and you can't make up for lost time, but you can do the right things to set it right, right? Yeah, for sure. For me, I always had a, um, a goal, a career thing, right? So for me, it was when I got injured, it was like, okay, I got to start walking, I got to start running. All right, I want to be a, I want to be in, in law enforcement. I got to, I got to get there. I got to get past the PT test. You think my wife was happy with that decision at the time? No, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, I almost lost you once. Let let's yeah, do something right, more risky. Right. And I kind of think about that, and I didn't really give her much of an opera, uh, you know, a say in it. A at say all. in it, and yeah. I think about it. And it's like Ooh, you probably should talk things through with your significant other or the loved one, or right. you know, and, and let them see where they're at. I wanted to ask you something. Speaking of like trying to be as real and honest and you know one of the things that I was kind of like shown about myself or taught while I was kind of going through all these you know different layers 
um, the word avoidance kept being shared with me. Yeah. And it was hard to hear. But do you think that your kind of pushing forward towards the next goal was like a way to kind of avoid yeah. things that you didn't want to deal with. Yeah, let me, let me, you know, I'll fill you in on a story just so you understand where that avoidance came in, right? And I didn't, I didn't see I was doing it. Right. I'm like, Psh, I'm, I'm, I'm breadwinner here. I'm a, I'm a go career. I mean, what, what do, what do you want from me, right? Right. And I didn't, I didn't have to deal with taking the kids to the, the, the doctor, the yeah. dentist. Right, uh, dropping everything. You know where you know where I really learned that. Yeah. My, when my wife decided to go, she wanted to go back to work, and guess what? I started having to do these things. Yeah, you know, yeah. What did I do? I became an asshole, and I started freaking out. Right. Go, oh my god, I can't handle it. And then she's like, I've been I've been doing that for, you know, you know 16, 10 years. 16, 10 yeah. years. You know, and and I'm sitting there going, this is crap. Blah blah. blah. And I'm going forward and going forward. And then I, again, that was a, an aha moment for me. Things are kind of normal. I try to I try to be a a better family man and, and make sure that I'm, that I'm doing those things to, uh, <laughs> yeah. Take the burden off of her as much as she's tries to take the burden off of me. Right. Yeah. Cause it's you a team. Know. Yeah. So for me, the critical mass, you know, I start from the beginning, you know, in, uh, you deployed in 2003, I deployed in 2004. Um, so we were more of an occupation force and doing satellite patrols. Um, we were just South of Baghdad, um, and the Sunni triangle or triangle of death was kind of the area we patrolled right around the same time that Fallujah was kicking off. Yeah, and, um, rough time. yeah, so we saw a, a significant amount of action and in uh, November in 2004, I lost a really close friend and that was where it became real for me. And that was, you talk about a light switch. That was for me, it was like no more games. Like I went from trying to be vigilant and do a good job to now I transformed into, now I want to be a hunter. You try to be professional. Yeah, because it was... But at that, at that point, when you start losing buddies who are close to you, it's like... Taking it personal. Well, yeah, and now you're like, you've suffered a loss. And you ratchet up the intensity because now you want the other side to suffer loss. And you want to never allow them to be able to do that to you again. Yeah. So now we're fighting hard and like we're going in and you know, we're, we're, we're going after these guys for real, you know? Um, and you know, I was a machine gunner at the 240 golf for it a few times and then I had the Mark 19 and, and you know, we got hit by a couple RPGs, uh, several mortars. Those are fun. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the, the IEDs were scary. But the RPG was for real. Like that, out of everything that I experienced over there, RPGs were the ones that scared me the most. Yeah, because you saw them coming. Fast forward, December, we got hit by the biggest IED, or one of the biggest IEDs at the time. And it was a bongo truck with, they said, about 17 155 rounds in the back. And um, usually I was the gunner. At this day, one of our other trucks could got hit by RPG. So. We had kind of spread loads of Marines into our trucks, and they had this 17-year-old kid um, bagging me and bagging me and bagging me. Corporal, I want to be up in the gun. And so we were doing a, you know, a, a basic routine run for some detainees down to Fab Kelsu, and we dropped him off. And I was like, all right, dude, yeah, yeah, you can ride in the gun on the way back. Now that's, so, a, that's a seat you don't na naturally want to give up. I did not. Know. He had right. been begging me for weeks. Right. And I'm like, no, it's my job. I'm the gunner. And... And it was, and he just, I cared about the dude and he was a gunner too. And I was like, all right, you know what? I do trust him. He was a good Marine for sure. He's, he is a good Marine. He's still, you know, alive and kicking and, and, you know, we talk regularly and he's a good dude. Um, and so he's up in the gun. I'm in the back seat behind the driver. We come around this corner, we get into the highway and a dump truck stops, pulled out in front of us. Bongo truck is in the median, detonates blows our truck from one side of the highway to the other. We didn't roll, but it just slid. The guys behind us um, said that it, our Humvee just basically disappeared in a fireball. I was knocked out, the door separated, cracked my helmet, knocked me out, massive contusions up and down the left side of my body. Um, and I had to go to the Baghdad hospital and do some physical therapy. I couldn't bend my leg, um, rough shape. Definitely not an RPG to the face, rough shape, but, um, and I, I can totally relate 
to wanting to go back because I was given the opp opportunity to go to Germany and I refused. I said, I, I've heard that everyone who goes to Germany goes from Germany and goes home. And I said, I want to finish this deployment and come home with my guys. Um, so I had to, you know, finish um, physical therapy. I had to complete a basic physical test for this army colonel that was there. And um, it was like, a, because my leg was so, um, just so swollen and bruised and um, deep down to the bone contusions, I had to duck walk across his little squad bay and it was like i started there i couldn't even bend my leg at all i was in crutches and then you know for me to be able to bend my leg all the way to where i was basically sitting on my ankle it was excruciating pain so like you were talking about focusing you got a goal you push forward yep. i had my uh, percocet or whatever it was that the doc gave me um so i scheduled this test and i figured out that if I got out of the hospital, and this was the green zone combat 86 cash in Baghdad, if I got out of the little hospital, there was a Chinese restaurant like two blocks away and they sold beer. And I don't know where I got cash, but I got cash from someone and they sold like these bigger cans of beer for a buck. And it was Teberg beer, which is like a Denmark beer. And so I bought a little six pack of this beer put it in my backpack, smuggled it back into the hospital, <laughs> went in my hooch, popped my Percocet, drank a beer, got as loopy as I could still... You Pretty know. limber, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> and I did his stupid little test. I duck walked across the, uh, the squad bay. And I, I guess I was young and dumb and I thought I was fooling him. I'm sure you weren't. And he was like, <laughs> he looked at me, he's like, look at me in the eyes of my pupils. must have been like this big. And I'm like trying to focus on him and he's like, you did what I asked and good job, but you're nuts. I'm like, what, what did you, and he could probably smell the beer on my friend. Jesus. And I mean, good on him for not like, he could tell what I wanted and he wasn't going to like get me in trouble for doing, you know, I wanted to go back to my unit. And so he did um, sign the paper, but he told me I had to wait a couple of days. And then the Black Hawk actually brought me back to my base. And the funny thing of the Black Hawk, I get there and it was just the pilot and the co-pilot. Yeah. And there was no gunners. two 240s hanging on the side. <laughs> and there's no gunners. And so they go to strap me in and I'm like, no, where's the gunners at? And they're like, we're just bringing you, it's like a 10 minute trip. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not gonna sit here with a gun unmanned. <laughs> so I made them strap me into the gun. And I'm sitting there like, and I, and I still couldn't wear a helmet because I had a, my head was still swollen. I had a, a chit for no helmet, or whatever, until I, the swelling went down a little bit. But I'm sitting there with like a bandage on, hanging onto the 240 golf like, on the side geez. of a Black Hawk, getting back to the base. Um, but anyway, so then, um, like I said in the last episode, I went through the whole adrenaline, adrenaline junkie phase, got married, had two boys, and really for the longest time just considered myself to be normal, fine, good to go. And would not admit to any kind of weakness or abnormality or how do you pronounce that word? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It basically wasn't, there was nothing wrong with me and would never admit that there was anything wrong. And the problem is when you have that mentality, it always gets worse because you're not putting any effort into getting better and you're building, reinforcing this mentality of you're fine. And so you're burying those feelings. You're, you, oh yeah. So the feelings were <laughs> under 10 feet of concrete mm. and there was my flag was planted on top and I was the wind was blowing, the sun was shining, I'm good. Yep. Meanwhile, you know, the fights with my wife were getting more intense. Um, it got to the point where I ended up going and living in a hotel for a while. Um, I was missing out on, like, family uh, moments with my kids. We were going to go out, uh, go out to the lake and go out on a boat. And we had this plan, and then we got into this fight, and it was a nothing fight. 
I don't even remember what we were fighting about. Something stupid. Mm. And it seems like the nothing fights are always the ones that get the most intense, the most visceral, and you just say the most nasty things to each other. And it's just, you cause so much damage. And it's hard to repair that damage. You, you break trust and you cross lines. And then once you cross that line, you, it seems like you always ratchet to that same point. And my wife basically said, you know, I can't be around you like this. And um, I gave her so much credit because she stuck with me through everything and always wanted to support me. But I needed to take the step myself. I needed to start admitting, A, that these weren't, these feelings weren't, I don't even want to say they weren't normal because I think it is normal to feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't healthy. They weren't positive. They weren't getting me good results within my relationship or just my life in general. And so uh, I started going to the vet center first and it was really, really hard to relate. The person that I was talking to was not a combat veteran. She was not in the military. She was nice, but I think what she was doing, and I didn't like it, was almost enabling me to just feel sorry for myself, yeah. the situation I was in. And we had several sessions, and finally I told her, and I just tried to be as honest as I could. I was like, I'm not getting what I need out of this. I'm not getting... I was like, you're having me talk about situations in Iraq and, and relive moments and, and, and all this stuff, which I'm sure is probably in some book somewhere says this is what you do when you're talking to someone who has PTSD. Problem is I wasn't admitting that I had any PTSD. So I said, what I'm really looking for is I need you to tell me what to do. And so she said, I can't do that for you, but if you check out this program, and it was very similar to what you were talking about, it was a two-week um, intensive clinical program, or ICP, through what's called the Home Base Program, and it's funded by Mass General Hospital, and it's in Mass Boston, Massachusetts. So I contacted them, and they had this two-week course, and it was, you had to go to this hotel, you were not allowed to drink or do drugs, you had to have a piss test every day, you had a curfew. You had to be back in your hotel room by 10 p.m. And there was it was like a school setting. And I I agreed to do it. And I had to schedule some work around it. And um, there was, I think, 12 other guys there that were in the program with me. And the cool thing about that program was it was all... 90% of it was in a group setting. So you sat in a classroom and you talked through, you listened more through lecture, but they talked about not necessarily like feelings and like what you, like how you feel, but more the science behind yep. how emotions work and stuff that I had never even heard about. No one taught you this stuff in, in biology class. Definitely didn't learn about it in the Marine Corps, but the chemistry that goes on in your brain and how oxytocin and, and all these other chemicals in your brain interact with each other and how the things that you do release these chemicals. You know, if you feel great after a workout or sex or, you know, drinking a beer, it's because what you did released a chemical in your brain that makes you feel good. And you have the chemicals in your brain that feel good from doing something in the moment. And you have the chemicals that feel good when you did something that's actually good for you in general over yeah. time. And so the, the purpose, one of the things that they taught you in the class was instead of trying to get through a moment and feel better in a moment, start creating habits that make your life better so that when you get to a moment that sucks, you have a better foundation so that you don't tip over. 
Like you don't, you're not built on this sandy foundation where one wave comes by and it knocks you over and you're done. You build this foundation of good habits, you know. And so one of the counselors said, you know, I was in, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was pretty physically fit, first class PFT, and, you know, had no problem running, pull-ups, push-ups, all that stuff. I, I loved it. But as I got out, as I started getting older, <laughs> I got very soft. And um, so one of the counselors made me commit to signing up for a CrossFit gym. So I did that. Um, then one of the other things that they did was, um, they talked about dialectical behavioral therapy, which is an acronym. Everything's an acronym, DBT. And what that is, um, in a nutshell is basically identifying areas in your life or moments that you struggle with. Let's say it's, uh, traffic really triggers an emotion or let's say, um, a crowded room, a theater, any of the things that you might struggle with. What it does is you don't want to have this mentality and say, well, I just can't handle traffic. I can't handle a crowded room. I can't go to the movies because you're telling yourself that this is your new normal. I, I didn't want to drive in traffic. You know, I live in New Hampshire and I drive to Boston. It sucks. That traffic blows but it's a necessity i have to be able to do it so instead of saying i can't do it this dbt talks about how you find something that sucks you're not good at or you can't do and introduce it in bite-sized pieces so instead of trying to drive to boston in peak traffic mm -hmm. where you know you're just going to Blow your lid and lose it and you're done. Mm -hmm. Instead, find an area where it's a little bit of traffic and give yourself a small dose of exposure and then know when you're going to be done. Like, I only need to make it for 20 minutes and then I'm done. Yep. And what you do is, just like any other skill you learned in the Marine Corps or the military or whatever it is in life, you expose yourself to small doses of it you master that level and then you increase it. And it was such a different look or take on how to handle things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, and day-to-day -day stuff where you just can't handle it. And it was so refreshing to have what I was looking for, a step-by-step -step training process, something I could actually physically do and gauge performance and look back and be like, okay, I, I'm, building confidence. Now I, I know that I can handle this level of stress. Now I'm going to try a little bit more. And there, there's so many different theories out there and so much different ideas on how to handle this kind of stuff. And, and it really bothers me when I, you know, see people on Facebook or, or Instagram or, or people you meet on, you know, you know, on day-to-day -day life and you see them struggling with stuff and you hear them say things like, I can't handle it or I can't do that or, you know, this is how I am now. And it's like a, you've basically given yourself almost like a death sentence. And it's like, you look at me like, I, for me, my critical mass moment was when I saw where I was and saw what I couldn't handle and I got fed up. I said, I don't want my life to be like that. I want my life to be this instead. So I went out and I found resources and I found someone who could teach me how to get to where I wanted to be. And part of that was, I absolutely hated it, but part of that was taking antidepressants for a little while. And I had great doctors that taught me a lot about how the medicine works. And we'll get into uh, one of the next podcasts coming up. I really want to talk a lot about how the chemicals in your brain interact with the chemicals in an antidepressants because it's it's a lot of stuff out there and there's a lot of education. And if you're going to take that stuff, you should 100% know how it works because I, I didn't want to take them. I hated taking them and I did it because I was told to do it. And, but I had an exit strategy. So I took it for a specific amount of time. And when I knew that I could get off of it, I did. 
and I looked back at it as a stepping stone to the next step. And to be able, the, the, to, be able to get off of it was like amazing to me. Um, but I look back and I'm like, why would I avoid doing something that's going to be good for me? Like, what was my reasoning? It wasn't logic. It was emotional, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that they talk about in the, this class that I learned, and we'll get into another, another episode about this specifically, emotions. They, they showed me this wheel of emotions, right? Yep. When you're a Marine, you have like three emotions. Kill, kill, and kill. You're exactly right. <laughs> You've got what? Like anger, intensity. You've got, you know, laughing and humor, which is a huge part of the Marine Corps. And I loved, <laughs> I, I laughed harder with Marines than I've ever laughed with anyone else. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that draws me back to any time. You know, we talk about how we met. You know, I was on an airplane coming from D.C. back home. And I'm sitting right next to your wife. And I meet your wife and we're chatting. And, and you know, I give your wife a lot of credit because I'm not the kind of person that necessarily would open up to a complete stranger. <laughs> but she's sitting there, she's talking, and, and it was one of those moments. And another thing that they taught in this class, and we'll get into another podcast about this because there's another huge topic, um, but comfort zones. Because when you're dealing with PTSD, anxiety, depression, those kinds of things, you retreat to a comfort zone. Yep. And that comfort zone feels good in the moment, but... <clears throat> It's so detrimental to you in the long run. It is. So a classic little example of comfort zone, you know, missing out on a great opportunity by staying in my comfort zone. Um, this podcast right here is a classic example of me, you know, I wanted to do this podcast for so long, but I was nervous to do it because I didn't know if I'd be good. I didn't know if I'd have the right things to talk about, you know, like, and you know, I had so many people saying like, just fucking do it. And get off your ass and do it. And so, like, I'm thankful that we're on episode two. We've got the first one behind us. It's like the biggest milestone. Like, actually did it. Yeah. But like sitting next to your wife in this airplane, she starts chatting with me, and she and I don't remember what she said, but she just was like really like, "Hey, how are you doing? Like, are you a marine? Like, and and I think she asked about my deployment or something that was gonna start opening up me being a little bit of vulnerability, me being honest, me sharing some like personal stuff, which is not something I would necessarily do with a stranger I just met on a plane. But she said right <laughs> off the bat that she was married to a Marine and some instant risk assessment, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, the risk is I'm sharing something with a person that I don't know and I'm gonna have to trust sharing some stuff with this person I don't know. The reward is her husband's a Marine. Who knows where that could lead to? I could make a new friend. Um, and you know, where I was at, I didn't have a lot of Marines close to me. And for me, being able to hang out with other Marines was a huge part of like the process for me getting better because not having someone to identify with, hang out and, and have some camaraderie with was just, just you get too into your own head and you just kind of like retreat and you just can't relate to the coworker, you know, the civilian co coworkers and stuff. So anyway, um, that's basically, you know, your wife said, once you get off this plane, I want you to meet my husband. And then, you know, I sat at the end of the, the jet bridge and waited for you when we, we, we met each other. And, you know, a couple months later, you know, we were making a podcast together. So it's just funny how, A, there's two things. Getting outside that comfort zone led to a great opportunity. And then B, how Marines just are in general. You know, I've got probably a hundred different stories where you meet another jarhead and instantaneously there's that trust. Of course there is. And that's one of the reasons that I thought this podcast would be so good is because if we were two civilian doctors talking about PTSD, chemicals, brain, blah, blah, blah. It's just not, it's not going to have that same impact. But you see two devil dogs, 
you know, combat veterans talking about their experience. And you've got other guys who had the same exact background, same exact roots, boot camp all the way up through deployment. It's like an instant connection, an instant trust that's right there. Yeah. And so, um, anyways, that was a. It, it's the it's the same thing though. I mean, you there's a ton of different jobs in the service, right? There's a ton of different jobs out there in the civilian world, and like we'll take the Marine Corps for instance. But like everybody was a grunt, or O three thirty one, or O three fifty two, or O three forty one, or O three eleven. We're all kind of cut from that same cloth, or even special forces, things like that, right? We're all cut from that, that's the same cloth of mission objective, getting things done. And just because they didn't deal with an explosion or getting blown across half the, half the highway or not ducking in time, you know, doesn't make them really much. I mean, we just had to learn to adapt to a different, a different deal. I mean, I, I look at it, hey, I'm, I'm happy that someone was watching out for me. Right. Like, I, Compared to what I've seen some guys go through and, you know, these guys that, you know, missing all their limbs and they have the best attitude in the world. And you look at them going, man, I was getting depressed because I had a couple scars on my face. And then here you are going running past me in a marathon or, you know, wheeling along in a chair, or like sm all smiles. Like oh, yeah. that's, that's just finding that, that fight within. And, and that's what we need to do again. You know, it comes down to, we hit these critical mass spots. We just got to understand that pe people have feelings. Right, um, that we're not the only one walking through this lonely, lonely life all by ourselves, and I, I think it's awesome that uh, you know to to connect with veterans that, that have yeah. been through this. I mean, I have another buddy; he really big um, into the home base program. Swears by it. His name's Kurt Power, you know, and uh, good buddy of mine. And we met at a wounded warrior project that we were doing where we were building flags. And he got hit by a sniper. And I'm like, and he had the bullet. He still had the bullet on a dog tag. And, you know, he's in the Army, and I won't hold that against him. <laughs> but, well, a little. But, you know, um, you know, I'm like, I'm like, that's badass. And yeah. he's like, dude, he's like, you got shot in the face with an RPG. And I'm like, no, no. I'm like, I don't have the RPG on a dog tag. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you know. And, quite the dog and we kind of We kind of look at the different things that we've all been through, and we all have unique different stories. But that. It's recognizing that where you're at critical mass. You took the steps to to correct that. I felt, you know, I was getting to a point that if I didn't learn something about something, you know, just you know, real quick to think, think of your brain running in, you know, these 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 veins like this all the time, right? And something happens, and then they get all tied up and knotted up. Well, we got to fix those. We got to get them back to where the the stuff can flow through it. Right. And you don't. You don't fix it by going, oh, how did you feel the night that that happened? Yeah, right. <laughs> and you don't fix it by avoiding it. Right, and you don't. Yeah, you definitely fi don't fix it by avoiding because where's or that get like you? Didn't happen, or right? Because it did happen. Yeah, and it's and again, we 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 touched on it, but it's dealing with the new normal in your life and and owning it and being proud of it. Yeah, um, you know. But that's again, I you know, I I say that to the viewers, and I wouldn't be. We we met on a plane because of my wife, two jarheads in a completely different. I mean, you were. You were down in D.C. doing something completely different, so was I, and we just happened to be on the same plane. Right. Um, that's that's powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful stuff. One of the things that you were talking about, and you talk about feelings, and you talk about emotions, and I think if I was going to leave this episode on a, um, a, a wrap-up or, or a, a end note, for me, it would be, Feelings are okay. Like we, as Marines, as, as combat veterans, soldiers, what have you, were ingrained and taught so much that anything outside of those feelings of aggression, anger, bravado, you know, that stuff, sorrow, sadness, fear, any of that is considered weakness. The, the truth is it's not. Fear is not a weakness. If you are scared that you're going to go to a counseling session and learn something about yourself that you might not be able to handle, 
That's not a weakness. That's a totally natural emotion to feel. Mm -hmm. And when you become okay with being sad and, and scared and having real human emotions, like we were designed and created to have these emotions because, you know, you can't have, you can't really enjoy happiness without having experienced sorrow. You can't be courageous without knowing what fear is. And if you don't allow yourself to be scared or sad or have these real emotions and you numb them, one of the things that I learned was when you numb fear and you numb sadness, you also numb your happiness. You can't numb one side of it and leave the rest. You numb it all yeah. because you, you just don't allow yourself to feel. And it's a, it's a protective safety measure and it's natural to do that too. But just like any biological safety measure that your body does naturally or fight or flight mode, it is meant to be momentary. You're not meant to avoid being scared or fearful or sad forever. You're meant to avoid it in the moment so that your body can react in a way to protect you from death, you know? Um, but when you're dealing with emotions that lead to depression or anxiety or PTSD uh, and anything else, if you don't allow yourself to feel that stuff, you can't have a fulfilled real life. Nope. And so, you know, my biggest thing to end this episode would be is let yourself be okay with feeling natural emotions. Try to start realizing that fear, sadness, um, getting outside your comfort zone, it's not a weakness, it's a strength. Um, being an asshole all the time doesn't really make you a well-rounded person that, that has a fulfilled life. And I, excuse me, I think one of the things about depression is for me, purpose was the, a huge way to get past feeling depressed. Because if you're pushing through towards something that you enjoy or you care about or you are, is something that's important to you, it's really hard to be depressed and be pushing hard towards a goal at the same time. It's like they don't really, they don't drive. For, for me anyways, you know, I'll try really hard not to make general statements because I'm always talking about from my experience and hopefully, you know, there'll be enough people out there that relate to it and agree with me. But you got to find things that are worth living for and make that your priority. And if, if being a good husband or a good dad or being great at your job in the civilian sector is important to you, you're going to have to be human and, and, and allow yourself to feel. And you're going to have to learn to trust people that aren't necessarily combat veterans or people that can relate you're going to have to go outside that comfort zone and allow people to help you and share things and you don't have to share it all you don't have to get into the nitty gritty details about what you did or what you saw yeah. but if you say to someone yeah i'm struggling i'm feeling depressed you don't have to say why but if you at least get to that first step then that is a point where you can start making some progress from. Well, that's why there's so many programs out there that help us, right? Um, you know, for, for veterans and, and, and guys that have been through things. And you got to look at it. Woodworking might be your niche. Um, playing basketball might be your niche. Jumping out of a plane might be your niche. Crazy, but might be, it might be something that it gives you a sense of purpose and a sense of being. And like you said, it's, it's a great analogy. Start with those small steps. Don't, don't jump into the deep end, you know, not knowing how to swim, right? right? You know, 
take your time and understand yourself and your mind. And then a professional is going to be able to do the best with that. And understand, well, you know, in this in closing with us is that what I dealt with was different than what you dealt with. Right. Or the next veteran or anybody watching or, or paying attention to this. It, we all have different things that make us tick, motivate us, move us. But if you're, if you're in the comfort zone and you're just hanging out in the comfort zone, you're not making progress. You yeah. gotta be, you gotta become comfortable being uncomfortable. And I know that's an analogy yeah. everybody should know. Yeah, um, for sure. And that was, a, that was a huge um, thing that woke my eyes up, you know, when I was in this home base program was they, they drove that home, you know, consistently. And I'm like, if they're saying this every day to me, then this must be something that's important. And that was like, if your comfort zone is, you know, for me, there was times where I couldn't get off the couch. Well, you know, I, I was, rough. I was retreating up to a closed door upstairs in my house, turning all the lights off and just leave me the hell alone. Yeah. Um, isolating myself from any kind of stimulation that might aggravate me or irritate me or make me more upset. And so my comfort zone was this dark room by myself. That was like the comfort zone. That was where I felt comfortable without any light, any stimulation at all. That is a very unhealthy place to be. Yes. Um, and you're not going to make progress on any level retreating back to a comfort zone where you're not doing yourself any good. And so I agree with you. Like you have to get outside that comfort zone. You have to be comfortable operating in an area where you don't really feel good because that's where you grow. That's where you learn. That's where you become better. Yep. These real human emotions are not weaknesses. The comfort zone is scary as hell, but it's where you make all year of your improvement and if you can start allowing yourself to operate and work within those areas where you don't feel great or comfortable that's where you're going to see the most um improvement and 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 you're going to see your life start to get better and you consistently and this is where you need to be i remember what i was going to say the difference between motivation and discipline. As Marines, we talk about motivation, motivation. I, I'm here to motivate you, motivator, you know. Spree decor. Everything is about motivation, <laughs> which is great in a group setting when you have someone else to motivate you or you're doing something you enjoy and you're motivated to do it. But motivation will let you down when there is emotions. Mm -hmm. If you wake up and you're depressed, you don't have any motivation. You're not going to do anything because you're not motivated. Yep. So what you need to do is rely on discipline. Discipline is where you make your money. And discipline is where you will consistently create new habits and actually make progress. That's funny, right? Isn't that the same stuff you were taught in the Marine Corps through boot camp? You know, the repetitive, yeah. the discipline, all that hmm. Nobody's reinventing the wheel here. We're just learning how to re deal with it again now that we're... Right, yeah. You know, yeah, all the basic up. stuff that you've already learned, yeah. just reapply it yeah. and you'll be good to go. Yeah. So yeah. we'll close on that. Thank you very much for watching. We look forward to having you on the next show. Uh, we'll, again, we'll have links and we'll have opportunities for you to uh, discuss and give us your feedback. If there's something you liked about the show, Tell us if there's something that you hated about the show. Keep that shit to yourself. Uh, no, but we we, re, we uh, encourage any kind of feedback and any kind of... This should be a, a group discussion. We want to hear from you. We want to know how you're progressing. And if you think that this would be helpful for someone else, please share uh, the podcast with other people. Um, let's grow this into something big. This is something that we started, but we want our viewers and our listeners to uh, be a part of it as well. Help us grow this, help this turn. This could be go to any direction. It could, you know, it's sky's the limit. So if you would like to be a member or, or sorry, a guest on the podcast, contact us. And if you got something you want to share, uh, we'd love to have you on the show. And uh, thanks for watching and simplify out. See you next episode. You are now leaving the wire. 
proceed with caution.